Hello everybody and today we're going to discuss the imaging strategies that you can use for the practical management of advanced prostate cancer patients. Here are my usual disclosures. So we are aware that there have been several um, impacts of imaging on advanced prostate cancer management and I thought I'd go through some of these with you initially. We know that imaging is used to define clinical groups for uh, drug development and biomarker development and of course defines the clinical state for which therapy recommendations are made. Here are the uh, clinical states that all of you are aware of and you know that patients are divided into localized and advanced stages and the advanced stages are divided up into the castrate naive and the castrate resistant states and then within each of these groups there are different uh, subcategories. So for example in localized disease we have low, intermediate and high risk groups and in the castrate naive state we have the M0 as well as the M1 state. We are also aware that the anatomical location uh, of metastases in CRPC is highly prognostic adding to prognostic models that predict overall survival to docetaxel therapy and this was recently shown by this paper by Halabi uh, published in JCO showing that patients uh, with uh, metastatic liver disease had poorer outcomes compared to those patients with lymph node disease. We also know that patients with higher volume disease have worse overall survival here are data from um, bone scans showing poorer overall survival depending on the burden of disease but you can see that for both burdens of disease but for both uh, groups we can see that they can be effectively managed by the addition of enzalutamide. However, uh, we know that when you have high volume bone disease uh, with liver disease that in fact there may not be a benefit of um, using androgen access directed therapies alone and this is shown in these survival data and we are now aware that these patients in fact uh, benefit from the addition of um, chemotherapy. So here is the latest charted data showing an improved overall survival when ADT is used with docetaxel in high volume disease compared to uh, lower volumes of disease. So if you were to look at um, this um, pair of patients, both 84 years old, you can see that on the left we have a large volume bone disease, the primary is well controlled, um, there are no nodes, no visceral disease, this patient would benefit from ADT type treatments whereas the patient on the right has uncontrolled uh, pelvic disease with bladder invasion, liver and uh, pleural disease as well as bone metastases and this patient probably uh, should receive chemotherapy if he is fit to do so. So we should ask the question whether we think that the current clinical tool set is in fact fit for purpose. My view is that the current imaging methods leads to co poor confidence for assigning clinical states and for predicting therapy benefits. In fact, when we think patients have M0 disease, many a time they have M plus disease, and when we think they have oligometastatic disease, they have polymetastatic disease, and I'll show you some evidence behind this. And we also know that we fail to detect primary and secondary therapy resistance uh, in a timely fashion, which impedes patients' progress to other, other uh, potentially efficacious treatments. I just thought I would highlight that uh, in this example, this is a patient who is receiving anzalutamide as part of a clinical trial. You can see that on the screening study, the whole body MRI sc scan shows retroperitoneal lymph nodes as pointed out by the uh, red arrow. The bone scan is normal, indicating no bone metastases, uh, in fact confirmed by the whole body MRI scan. After 12 weeks of treatment, you can see a good PSA response. The retroperitoneal lymph nodes have decreased in volume and size and the bone scan remains the same. At week 25, after 24 weeks of treatment, in fact there is a new lesion that is visible on the whole body MRI scan and of course we can zoom down 
on this area and confirm that this is a metastatic deposit. Of course, we can also look at the prior two scans confirming that it is in fact a new lesion. However, in a clinical trial, the standard of care is the bone scan and the bone scan is still negative at week 25, so he receives more treatment. After 36 weeks of treatment, we can see two bone lesions on the bone scan, but we see five lesions on the whole body MRI scan. And as part of a clinical trial, we know that we need to wait to confirm the presence of new bone metastases so the patient receives another 12 weeks of treatment, at which time the PSA is only just beginning to increase and we can see a, a marked increase in the burden of bone disease and in fact in the burden of disease visible on the whole body MRI scan. So this is a nice example where the oligoprogressive disease was shown at after 24 weeks of treatment, but you can see that polymetastatic um, disease was only uh, confirmed 25 weeks later. And this need to wait before declaring progression can put patients at a disadvantage because of the increasing volume of disease that needs to be demonstrated before therapies can be changed. Now many of you will say that bone scans are combined with CT scans, so that makes things okay. Well, in general that is true for soft tissue disease, but you really need to be careful about the bones. Here is an example of a patient receiving enzalutamide, and you can see that there, although there is a bone scan flare that's seen quite rapidly, um, over time we see that the activity of uh, the bone scan decreases, indicating the patient that indicating that the patient is responding to enzalutamide, but if you were to look at the CT scans, you'll see the development of a new lesion. And of course, what this means is that the appearance of a new sclerotic lesion should not be considered as evidence of progression, and other findings need to be evaluated. If you look at this patient who superficially has similar appearances, this is clearly uh, progression. This is progression on the basis of new lesions that have emerged, but we also see skeletal related events with loss of vertebral height at several levels. You can see that he is increasingly symptomatic with nausea and bone pain and his PSA has gone up. What this indicates is that sclerotic progression and sclerotic healing can sometimes be difficult to distinguish. So how can we improve the situation? Well, we have a number of ways that we can look at the bone marrow space. And here are some of the techniques that are available in many clinics to be able to interrogate the bone marrow. And one of these techniques is the whole body MRI scan. Now, the whole body MRI scan uh, can be performed as a detection protocol in most modern scanners within 30 minutes. Comprehensive response assessments take a little bit longer, about 45 minutes. Now, it's imperative to have diffusion imaging as part of whole body MRI, because diffusion imaging looks at the microscopic um, motion of water within tissues, and when water is impeded in its motion uh, related to high cellularity, this leads to an altered signal, which is readily available. The important thing about this technology is that there are no injections, no isotopes, no contrast media. Um, this whole body diffusion scan um, took about 15 minutes. We now have quality standards uh, published in 2017, and we have an established reading method for which to be able to be able to report these scans. These scans are repeatable and they are quantitative. But furthermore, they are sensitive to therapy effects. So here's a patient who is responding to therapy. This patient with castrate naive prostate cancer was treated with uh, um, Zolodex and Docetaxel. We can see a good response to treatment on the diffusion scan, which is less evident on the morphologic sequences. Now, it is possible to um, quantitate the degree of response. But before we talk about the, uh, the, the quantification, you should know that this reduction in signal intensity that you see here is directly related to decreasing cellularity of the tissues that are being interrogated. As I said, it is possible to interrogate these tissues and quantify them. And here is an example 
of how we do the quantification with ADC maps. So the ADC maps and the classes are projected onto the signal intensity and then we can estimate the proportion of the segmented volume that shows no treatment effect. Before treatment you can see this is 95% and then we can see what the proportions are that are likely to be responding and highly likely to be responding depending on the thresholds chosen. So the same patient was followed over time and you can see that on the second examination that I already showed you that 21% of the tumor is in the active range at the end of 10 cycles of docetaxel we can see a persistent PSA response but we see that about 17% of the segmented marrow is still in the red color indicating continued active disease and then as the patient is monitored you can see that the volume of active disease increases to 85% there is a modest response to carbazitaxel which is not sustained and then finally the patient receives abiraterone and then again you see responding disease. So how good are clinicians at assessing the volume of disease? This uh, recent study uh, showed that 32% of patients who were thought to be M0 uh, castrate resistant prostate cancer were in fact uh, metastatic and here's an example of uh, a patient who was thought to have oligometastatic disease and turned out to have polymetastatic disease despite the fact that his PSA is slowly rising and is only about 8.9 um, nanograms per ml at the time of this examination. Numerous uh, systematic analyses have shown the advantages of next generation imaging tools uh, compared to bones and CT scans. We now have prospective studies also showing that whole body MRI has a similar diagnostic accuracy to sodium fluoride PET scans with, flu with fewer uh, equivocal lesions, um, in fact outperforming spec CT as well as the plain out bone scans and in fact this has been shown on meta-analyses also which show for example that the, that the fluorocholine PET scans are much more uh, accurate than bone scans and the test performance of whole body MRI and fluorocholine PET scans are equivalent but much better than the bone scan. So here's an example of where the fluorocholine does better than the whole body MRI scan. So you can see this green region here which was called negative on the whole body MRI scan uh, was in fact positive on the fluorocholine PET scan uh, whereas in this example we can see a positive area of abnormality on the whole body MRI scan and this was not prospectively detected on the fluorocholine uh, PET scan. So which imaging tests should you use in clinical practice for metastatic detection in the newly diagnosed? These are patients with unfavorable intermediate risk and high risk patients. Well, we are fairly confident that bone scans and CT scans are not robust enough for it ruling out or ruling in the presence of nodal and bone metastases. We think that a single modality is probably what's required for both bone and nodal disease. You could do a whole body MRI scan plus or minus local staging which can replace CT scans and bone scans particularly for um, the identification of early M plus disease but in fact choline PET scans and PSMA PET scans are probably more likely to be uh, effective but unfortunately are more expensive so we tend to use PET scans when whole body MRI scans are negative and clinical suspicion remains high and which imaging tests for clinical practice in the setting of biochemical recurrence. We prefer again to do whole body MRI scans but you could do PET scans with whatever tracer you have available to you but we think that um, you should also be performing systemic staging before doing local staging uh, if you are thinking of local salvage. The guidelines emphasize CT and bone scans but increasingly recognize the emerging role of uh, PET and, and uh, CT, uh, PET CT scans uh, and you can see that the in 2016 the NCCN guidelines as well as the EAU guidelines are now beginning to mention choline PET as well as PSMA. 
for the detection of metastases in biochemical recurrence. Now, the latest data was reviewed by the St. Gallen 2017 panelists, and they uh, also concurred that bone scans and CT scans uh, are not very effective at excluding metastases in these patients, and in fact, the majority of, uh, of panelists, in fact, more than 50% recommended um, next generation imaging uh, tools uh, for this purpose. Which imaging test should you use for response assessment in castrate naive uh, prostate cancer? Well, the guidelines um, are in fact quite silent on this. The proportion of patients developing radiographic progression without clinical or PSA progression uh, to ADT is unknown, but is thought to be uh, small. The St. Gallen panelists uh, recommended that some imaging should be done initially at uh, baseline and at the time of maximal response or the NADI or PSA and then when patients were relapsing. Imaging, however, is suggested for PSA oligosecretory disease. Imaging is also suggested for primary aggressive variant metastatic disease. So here is a patient who could have aggressive variant prostate cancer. You can see that his PSA is not very high at 12.8, but he has 1.2 liters of tumor, and he's got pancreatic metastases, perinephric metastases, and lymphangitis. So this patient would be considered as having aggressive variant prostate cancer. What about the imaging that you should use in metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer? We know that signs and symptoms alone are often recommended by the guidelines, but we're also now aware in 2016 that in patients receiving androgen access directed therapies that about 25% of patients can develop radiographic progression without clinical or PSA progression, uh, with 40% of patients with bone only disease at screening developing soft tissue disease at radiographic progression. We have similar statistics for radium 223 where known where non-bone disease progression occurs in about 46% of patients within three to six months of starting a radium. Here's an example of a patient who failed to show um, clinical or PSA progression but on imaging grounds has developed progression. So you can see on the second examination, there is disease progression, but uh, treatment was continued on abiraterone, and then he develops more progression and eventually develops cord compression for which he required radiotherapy. So the current guidelines all recommend the use of uh, imaging using CT scans and bone scans, except the last guideline, published in 2017 by the imaging community, which now recommended, which recommended using whole body MRI scans for this purpose. So, rec so regular imaging for monitoring is suggested uh, in metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer, again for the ag aggressive variants and for oligosecretory PSA disease. The frequency of monitoring is very different to the castrate-naive state. And you can see here's the castrate-naive state on the left-hand side. Here's the castrate-resistant state on the right-hand side. And you can see regular imaging uh, monitoring is recommended in castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Bone scans and CT scans should be used if next-generation imaging is not available. And this uh, is also, this point was also stressed by the panelists at the uh, APCC, um, with 25% of panelists recommending next generation imaging. Bone scan is the preferred economic choice, but a fluorocholine PET scan can be used as an alternative. Be careful about using PSMA PET CT, which may not inform on tumor cell viability when AR inhibition is continued. In terms of where we are at the moment, um, currently we are using bone scans, CT scans, symptoms, and PSA. And when we look at bone disease, the 
two categories that we have are progression and no progression. New imaging technologies will enable bone disease to be categorized as response stable and progression. So we've gone from two categories to three categories. And this really is a paradigm shift because it has oncological, uh, sorry, precision oncology impacts. And what do I mean by that? We know that imaging is part of next generation diagnostics, which include immunohistochemistry, uh, circulating DNA, uh, tumor markers, etc. These are used to decide on new molecular uh, pathology directed therapies, but then we use imaging to titrate patient treatments uh, over time uh, to try to keep the disease burden as low as possible for as long as possible. So here are my take home points, next generation imaging tools, uh, PET tracers, a whole body MRI, can detect bone metastases with a higher sensitivity than bone scans, earlier detection and therapy may have positive therapy implications. These next generation imaging uh, can positively uh, assess therapeutic response unlike bone scans which only look at tumor progression more accurate therapy assessments could aid in the rational development and the clinical use of targeted therapies, next generation imaging tools in metastatic prostate cancer, and their role within precision medicine has not yet been uh, completely evaluated. Thank you very much for listening to this video. I hope you found it useful. If you have any comments, please leave messages from me. Bye-bye.